Hi, I'm Mary Gaylord. I think the idea of honoring Don Quixote in any way imaginable is fantastic. And the idea of a festival strikes me as absolutely in tune with the spirit of Cervantes' book. I have come to Spanish culture and Hispanic cultures um, late, relatively late. I was not born into a Spanish-speaking family. Um, I did have French in school all the way through, but in college it occurred to me to learn some Spanish, and that experience blew me away. It was for me the way it was for Dorothy when she first entered Oz, and I just felt as though someone had given me emerald colored glasses and I was seeing the whole world in a different way. And I fell head over heels in love with the language. Then I went after college, I went to Spain on a Fulbright fellowship, and then I decided to devote myself to studying Spanish literature. And right in the center of the period that interested me the most is Cervantes' masterpiece, Don Quixote. And that has been more than 50 years ago, and I'm still obsessed with Don Quixote. I read it at least once a year. Sometimes I've had to read it by listening to it in audiobooks, but it's pretty incredible that way too. And uh, I have not ceased to find in it endless uh, subjects of fascination. In one of the uh, texts I'm going to talk about this afternoon is Cervantes' dedication uh, to uh, the Duke of Lerma, who was Viceroy of Naples when he published his book and who was a very big deal in the Spanish global empire. And he, he devote, dedicates his book to the Duke of Lerma in a comic fashion. And he tells him a cock and bull story uh, that he has just had a visit from an ambassador from the Grand Khan, the Emperor of China. And this Emperor of China has already heard about Don Quixote, <laughs> which is, of course, uh, a fantastic story. And he says that the Emperor of China has invited him to come to China to be the director of a college where the Spanish language will be taught to the Chinese and where Don Quixote will be the textbook. It's an astonishing little piece. It's about two pages long and it's hilariously funny um, because of course this is Cervantes making fun of the idea that he's very famous. So he tells the, he says to the ambassador, is there an is there a salary? Will I get travel expenses? What's in it for me? And the ambassador says, no, no, it's just the glory. And Cervantes says, no, well, you'll have to tell the Grand Khan that I'm an old man and that I'm sick and that I'm poor and that I can't go anywhere. Uh, and so they part company and then, uh, but the, but Cervantes says to the ambassador, he says, uh, but I have the Duke of Lerma here who's going to take care of me, I don't need the Emperor of China. <laughs> it's a very funny story. But I think that although Cervantes didn't really know that he would achieve this kind of uh, global resonance, he probably hoped so. And he would have been absolutely thrilled to know that people were talking about his book and celebrating it all of these years later. So today I'm going to talk about the engagement of this incredible two-part novel with ideas about writing history. It sounds pretty nerdy. The One of the central structural propositions of the book is that it really wasn't written by Cervantes or even his narrator, but that it was first written by a shadowy figure we never get to see in person, 
named Sidi Amete Berengeli, an Arab chronicler who has somehow gotten to know of the exploits of Don Quixote and created a history in manuscript. And the fiction is that Cervantes happens on this manuscript and gets a young Moorish boy to translate it for him. So this shadowy character is the frame uh, of the novel and he, Cervantes uses him at very important junctures like the first, uh, the second actually, Sally of Don Quixote and the third and he brings him in from time to time all the way through to make comments about the text and he uses him also to talk about what it means to write history and he brings him in at the end for the grand finale. Um, he lets the Arab chronicler say goodbye to the reader. He doesn't step in and do it himself. And so I want to ask why. Why does he choose this figure in the first place? It's not a serious figure, apparently. It's a funny figure. Cervantes invites us to laugh at this figure because he's kind of an impossibility in 1605 or 1615 in Spain, the Moors were either about to finally be expelled from the peninsula, and it wasn't even legal to publish books in Arabic. And so he puts the story of this supposedly great or would-be great Spanish hero into the hands of a Moorish chronicler, an Arab chronicler. Why in the world? Would he do that? That's what I want to ask. And I think that he had a number of rather serious purposes in mind. And I'm going to talk about some of them today. And this uh, leads me into the subject of his novel as a parody. We think of Don Quixote as primarily a parody of the chivalric romances and the narrator and the Arab chronicler say that they want to tell this real story of real, a real knight's exploits so that they can demolish the, um, what they call the machine of uh, chivalric fiction, which makes up these completely improbable, unbelievable stories about knights who never were. And so the fiction is that here I am presenting a real Spanish hero and I'm going to give you the real scoop and this is not full of lies. Well, turns out that's not exactly what happens. But we've all assumed that this is kind of a sophisticated joke and that Cervantes is using it to create a kind of mask for himself as a writer. Uh, in literary studies, we talk about metafiction, that is, books that comment on their own structure and their own status as fiction. And this Arab chronicler turns metafiction into metahistory. But the question is, does Cervantes do it just to create a mask for himself, or does he have something serious in mind? And I clearly think he does have something serious in mind. And what I've been doing in my research I just stumbled on pieces of this uh, case, little by little, over many, many years, is that uh, Cervantes tells us he and Don Quixote have been reading only chivalric romances. But it turns out, and I'm going to bring some examples today, that Don Quixote and Cervantes had been reading books of serious history, books written by official historians of the crown or the church, uh, and Cervantes is sending them up to. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Well, how would Cervantes look at all of this today? Would he write the same novel? I think potentially he could write the same novel right now right today because his hero and his fictional Arab chronicler uh, are self-promoters, promoters of uh, Spanish exceptionalism, 
of Spanish Christian exceptionalism. Uh, they are, uh, they overstate everything in the interest of defending this vision uh, of the truth. They call everyone else liars. Um, they One thing that's been painful for me, frankly, is to become aware that Don Quixote, who's the character I have come to just love and feel is my, my friend, although I think Cervantes means us to have a critical view of him, but that he uh, is acting out this kind of um, vainglorious, uh, self-promotion in the name of uh, heroic virtues and in the name of the interests of the country uh, and of uh, his faith. It pains me deeply to see those parallels today, but I think they're absolutely there. Uh, I think uh, when Cervantes in the, uh, in the dedication to the second volume uh, when he mocks himself for being a little bit vain about and thinking uh, that he has achieved a fame that is really over the top and beyond anything he could possibly uh, imagine. Uh, I think this shows that Cervantes was really concerned about this kind of representation of virtue and identity and importance and cultural importance. Um, I think Cervantes, I think he might have been the Salman Rushdie of today. Uh, I haven't really gotten into the uh, Golden House yet, uh, but I heard an interview about it on public television in which uh, Rushdie said something I think could have come right out of Cervantes' mouth, and that is that when our leaders and the communication media, some at least, are peddling lies, it falls to novelists to tell the truth. And I think that that's one way to speak about the Quixote, because as anybody who's gotten even a few chapters into the Quixote knows, Cervantes doesn't talk about, uh, he doesn't talk only about self-promoting uh, superheroes. He talks about people who he meets on the road, and uh, he talks about people leading ordinary lives. It's not a cast of noblemen and prelates and uh, monarchs uh, and superheroes, but just ordinary people who come from everywhere. I'm really drawn to the character of Sancho Panza. Everyone is, and in fact in, in the second volume of the book that's one thing that's talked about right off the bat is that all the first readers just don't want Sancho Panza to stop talking and they are exasperated with Don Quixote when he tries to shut him up. I, one of the reasons I love Sancho Panza, a friend of mine um, who taught at Georgetown University for years, uh, wrote an article um, in which he described Sancho, Panza's, uh, Sancho Panza as a second language learner. <laughs> and, and what he meant by this is that throughout Don Quixote's history. Sancho doesn't know anything about chivalry. He's never read a chivalric romance. And Don Quixote speaks in chivalric a good bit of the time. And so he has to teach Sancho this language. And Sancho is sort of a good learner. He's kind of a B-plus learner. He gets a lot of it right, but he stumbles a lot and he, his speech is full of malapropisms that Cervantes makes very revealing. They're not innocent at all. They're, uh, they kind of become a, um, a, a, a
prick in the balloon of, of the chivalric um, dream. And Sancho, I like Sancho because I think he develops the most as a character um, in, in Don Quixote. At the beginning, he is just an apprentice. Um, and if he's just a, a, a kind of practical guy who's thinking about the, his next meal and what he can get out of things. But he uh, takes on so much humanity and the relationship between Don Quixote and Sancho uh, becomes so deep. It's very complex because Don Quixote always wants to pull rank, but they're friends. They become friends and they, they, and they have a deep love for each other and a, a deep respect for each other. So I, that's my favorite. I think a lot of people have uh, maintained that uh, Don Quixote uses Sancho Panza um, for his own ends and uh, that there really isn't very much in it for him. That he comes home pretty much as he went out and he says that. But when, but Cervantes has, has uh, Sancho's wife put that question to him. You know, what did you gain from all of this? Here you've come back and we've, you left us alone all this time and what good did it do us? And you didn't get any of the glory. And Sancho says, no, I, uh, I've seen the world. I've been through great adventures. Some of them have not gone so well, but I come back not with uh, the spoils of conquest, but with, he says, things of, uh, of greater importance, greater knowledge uh, of the world. I think uh, Sancho gets what probably few peasants would have gotten uh, from uh, Nidalgo, who happened to be their neighbor, um, which is real respect and real, uh, a real recognition uh, of his humanity. And, and Sancho um, is heard, and Cervantes uh, allows Sancho to discuss pretty weighty issues like parenting, like justice, like, um, oh gosh, there are, I mean, just endless subjects because dialogue between the two, it's not a dialogue weighted only in the direction of Don Quixote. And in the Renaissance, uh, scholars, educated people, believed in the idea of natural wisdom. That's why they collected proverbs. S Sancho is kind of a walking anthology of popular wisdom. And he spouts it all the time. And at first, Don Quixote puts him down for that. And then Don Quixote starts doing the same thing. So they even out. Uh, Salvador de Madariaga, uh, great uh, reader of uh, Cervantes, um, talks about the Quixotización de Sancho and the Sanchificación de Don Quixote. He says that, uh, that Sancho becomes more quixotic. He starts to dream. He's allowed to dream, he's allowed to think big. Um, and Don Quixote moves in the other direction. He comes back down to earth. Is this relevant today? Oh, I think so. I think so, because we are at a moment when we're having particular trouble establishing lines of communication, real deep communication between people who have had the privilege of extensive education and people who haven't, between people from uh, completely different parts of the same society. And what Cervantes does is something that had never been done before in fiction uh, in his day. In his day, there were picaresque novels about low-life characters and commoners and there were chivalric romances or pastoral romances about knights and courtiers, lofty people with lofty ideas about the world who didn't care where 
they didn't think about where their next meal was coming from. They didn't have to. That was all taken care of uh, for them. But they were separate in their literary representation. Cervantes brings them all together. I think the, one of the implications I take away from the idea that Cervantes is really going after official historians is that he knows that they are the ones who decide what should be included in the official record and what shouldn't. And he knows that they don't include the stories of foreigners, of marginalized classes, of women, uh, of little boys who are doing child labor and being whipped for it, like the boy Andres in chapter four, like the little boy who's going, young man, he's a teenager, 18 years old, going off to war, who sings a song. He's just, he just comes across the stage like a, you know, a flitting image, but he's singing a little seguidilla, a little Andalusian dance song, and he says, I'm going to war because I'm needy. I wouldn't go if I had money in Didi. And there you are. You know, this is Don Quixote is flying this um, glorious idea of combat and everything that it's going to achieve and the benefits it's going to bring to the uh, to the warrior. But this boy knows that most people go to war because they need a job and they need something to eat and this is the way they can survive in a society that really has not kept a level playing field as uh, some say now um, between the haves and the have-nots. So uh, I think that Cervantes' decision to write an inclusive novel, that's revolutionary in literary terms because this mixing of genres that used to be separate is absolutely revolutionary. It's also revolutionary to bring real history into the novel. Usually history is kept carefully apart from fiction. Then there are pseudo histories that try to pretend to be histories. But Cervantes brings everything together. He brings real life, uh, real experience, painful stuff, um, and, and voices that haven't been heard enough. Women in particular, the, the Quixote is full of women, uh, voice, women's voices. It's also full of women characters who pull the strings, who move the action. So, yeah. I think that this book has, has um, not only stood the test of time, but has grown in relevance uh, over time because Cervantes constructed it in a way that was deeply relevant to him and in his own time. So that particular relevance can translate into a more universal relevance for other people later. Let me. Uh, illustrate that. You mentioned the um, image of Don Quixote in a cage. It's really in a cart like a circus animal. He's being uh, treated like a freak and also coerced into returning uh, home. Um, he's being treated like a madman. In the 16th century, madmen were isolated from their communities and women and they were shipped off and and treated like subhuman species. And I think that episode was probably deeply moving for Cervantes to write because he tells us in his prologue, he said, this book was born in prison. It wasn't born in some beautiful elegant garden with fountains and flowers. It was born in prison where every kind of misery um, lives, he says. And it was. He conceived this idea while he was in prison in Seville for supposed irregularities in accounting 
uh, as part of his activity as a provisioner for uh, the Spanish troops, troops that went to the Spanish Armada. So he knows what he's talking about. He also spent five and a half years in a prison in Algiers before he ever published anything. He was coming back from a, uh, a great military battle in the Eastern Mediterranean. He was captured. He was imprisoned for five and a half years. He knew about prison. And he knew that people were being imprisoned for not very good reasons everywhere. And I think it's that kind of really pulling it. In fact, the Algiers prison experience gets its own three chapters in book one because a fictional character who has many of the same experiences that Cervantes himself had gets to tell his own story, to tell what that was like. And so uh, it seems to me that uh, it's that quality of um, getting close and listening to voices who are talking about the most dreadful experiences in life as well as the highest aspirations of human beings that allows this book to just stretch over so much territory and gives so many places for people to get into. I've, uh, I've been since the um, since 2015, 16, excuse me, I've been thinking about Cervantes and Shakespeare and in the English language we talk a lot about Shakespeare as his plays as a kind of encyclopedia of human dramas. You go to Shakespeare's plays and you find every kind of character. You find and you find wonderful speeches that are tailored to express the existential um, response to all kinds of situations. I think you find all of that in one book in Don Quixote. And that's why uh, Cervantes says, uh, has, has characters say, better uh, said, he has his, one of his characters say at the beginning of book two of talking about his first volume, he said, this book is great because it has everything. And it does. Am I a Quixote? Oh yes. I think we all are. I don't think about the sage chronicler who will write the story of my life. That I don't do. But I do think about writing memoirs. I think about trying to sum up the meaning of my existence. Um, that's a quixotic project if ever there was one. And I do think about what my life will mean after I'm gone. And that's Quixote too. Thank you. Thank you. I am Quixote. Are you?